is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> that was my reaction when I first learned about the special graces that our Lord offers on Divine Mercy Sunday. I was in college when I learned about this and I thought, people need to know. <laughs> Gotta tell everybody. And so I was very pleased when my Aunt Mickey sent me a whole bunch of pamphlets about Divine Mercy Sunday. And I went running all around the campus of Notre Dame with those pamphlets to put them in the chapels of every dorm building on that campus. And people at Notre Dame like to playfully say that the first person that you walk around one of the lakes with is the person that you're going to marry. Well, uh, the only time I went around one of those lakes was when I was trying to get to one of the farther men's dorms and I was carrying all these images of Jesus as the divine mercy. <laughs> and so I find it very fitting that I am now in perpetual vows and priesthood with the fathers of mercy and I get to adore God daily in this beautiful chapel of divine mercy. <laughs> Another thing I was very pleased about back then in college was that my aunt also donated this huge image of the divine mercy uh, in a beautiful gold frame with glass uh, to be hung up in the chapel of my dorm, Morrissey Hall. But sadly, the shipping company did not handle it with care and the glass broke and it actually ripped off. It, it disfigured part of the image on our Lord's face. Uh, now my aunt did send another image and that one eventually did go up in the chapel uh, but out of reverence for our lord not wanting to throw away that other image because it was a slight disfigurement uh, i didn't want to throw it away i actually kept that nice huge image in my room in my individual dorm room for the rest of my senior year <laughs> but a, a complete image is better than a disfigured one <laughs> uh, so uh, as our lord is inviting us to reflect on, to contemplate his divine mercy, to respond to it, and to invoke his mercy upon the whole world, we want to make sure that we have a complete image, a complete view, because just as a material image can get disfigured, it's also possible for us to have a incomplete or disfigured image of God's mercy in our spiritual life. What does a complete image start with? Well, it starts with a good definition of mercy. Uh, one of my favorite definitions of mercy is making someone else's misery our very own. Mercy is making someone else's misery our very own. It's when we recognize someone has this need or this lack that they cannot remedy by themselves. And we are moved with a desire to remedy it for them, to take it upon ourselves, and to, we act to do so. And so we can understand God's mercy in this way, recognizing our misery, things that we cannot remedy ourselves, and he acts on our behalf to remedy that misery. Uh, with that being said, the first act of God's mercy is creation. Creation itself. Uh, God recognizes that we cannot create ourselves, we cannot give ourselves existence, and we cannot hold ourselves in existence. And so we can say that God not only lovingly, but also mercifully holds us in existence. He holds this whole universe in existence. Uh, that's the first major act of his mercy. The second major work of God's mercy is our redemption. After Adam and Eve, they fell into sin, they broke communion with God through sin, God promises the Redeemer. And we continue to celebrate on this Sunday the reality of Easter. Uh, we celebrate a whole Easter octave. The eight days, the first eight days of the Easter season, they are celebrated as one as the same day. Uh, many of the prayers that we pray as priests, they're the same for all of those days of the Easter octave. And so it's very fitting that we celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday on this day. Our Lord said that I want the second Sunday after Easter to be the feast of my mercy. We celebrate that he has redeemed us. That yes, he rose from the dead. Everything he said is true. And he has, he has saved us from sin and offered us new life. Right? We are now dead to sin and rise to life in Christ. Uh, not only are we saved from hell, but he, he also mercifully offers us the chance again to enjoy divine intimacy, to enjoy union with him. This begins at our baptism. But that mercy keeps going even after that because we know we can commit what we call mortal sin. A grave sin with full knowledge, 
full consent of the will. When we do that, we die spiritually. We lose his grace. We break communion with him again. But he is so merciful that he gives us the chance to receive that divine life anew through confession. And so we have in the gospel today the institution of confession. Our Lord, after his resurrection, he appears to the apostles and he says, peace be with you. He says it twice. And in this context of wishing us peace, he institutes the sacrament of confession. He breathes on them, the Holy Spirit. He says, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Speaking to his apostles, whose sins you retain are retained. People say, oh, God alone can forgive sins. Yes, this is true. But Jesus, who is God, breathes the Holy Spirit on his apostles. The Holy Spirit is also God. And he gives the Holy Spirit to them with this special power to forgive sins in his name. Uh, Jesus told St. Faustina, When you approach the confessional, know this, that I myself am waiting there for you. I am only hidden by the priest, but I myself act in your soul. Here, the misery of the soul meets the God of mercy. And of course, we know that God is not bound by his sacraments. If a person cannot make it to confession, they can't get to a priest, they're in danger of death, but they repent of their sins. God will honor that. God can, can grant the effects of his mercy even outside the sacraments. But confession is the ordinary means that God chooses to use to forgive mortal sins committed after baptism. He chooses to work through his priest as an instrument. He also says to St. Faustina, come with faith to the feet of my representative. Make your confession before me. He says, the person of the priest is for me only a screen. Never analyze what sort of priest it is that I am making use of Open your soul in confession as you would to me, and I will fill it with my light. Jesus refers to confession as the tribunal of his mercy. No matter what our sins are, no matter how grave our sins are, no matter how many times we have committed them, they are not bigger than God's mercy. He is so ready to wipe them all away in that sacrament of confession. This is an accurate view, an accurate image of God's mercy. What would be a disfigured view of God's mercy? Well, one would be despair, believing that my sins are so grave or there are so many that God's mercy is not enough, that even God cannot forgive me my sins. That's a false image of divine mercy. There's also the opposite of that. We have presumption. Where we have the attitude, if God is merciful, then he will forgive my sins and let me go to heaven, even if I don't repent of them, uh, even if I don't resolve to try to avoid those sins in the future. It's another false image of divine mercy. A humble and contrite heart, God will not spurn. Right? And so we, we show that humility by repenting of the sin, contrition, choosing to be sorry. Admitting that we have done wrong, that we have offended God, we wish we could take it back, we're going to try not to do it again. Then we receive God's mercy. Now another very common, incomplete view of God's mercy is the whole Protestant theology about once saved, always saved. I found myself in conversation recently with a, a Protestant gentleman, and he was very firm in his conviction that salvation cannot be lost. We talked about different passages of the scripture, and he found a way to interpret all of them that, no, salvation cannot be lost. Once saved, always saved. And, and I asked, uh, so uh, are you saying that a person who has accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you know, they have, they have made their act of faith before him, that it is no longer possible for them to later freely choose to reject him, to walk away from him, to offend God through grave sins. And he said, no, I don't think it's possible. He said that the, the true believer no longer wants to sin. 
And so the idea is that you know, for those who are true believers, yeah, they, they never go back to their sin. God doesn't let this happen. Uh, and it, if they do go back to sin, well, then it's that they were never a true believer. Or it's that, okay, they, maybe they are a true believer. They still go back to sin. It's the idea that those sins can no longer have a negative impact on their relationship with God. That their future sins, after they have accepted Christ as their Savior, those future sins can no longer separate them from God, can no, no longer wound that relationship in any way. And this, is, this can seem a very good thing. It's a, it's a very convenient theology, and that person was like rejoicing, like, yes, it's so freeing to know that I can never lose it, that, you know, it doesn't depend on me. No, it's just Jesus. He, he does it all. Uh, very convenient way of thinking, but ultimately wrong. And also a, an, an impoverished view of God's mercy. Right? The truth of God's mercy is much more beautiful. Right? It, first of all, wrong in that uh, our relationship with God uh, it's, it's affected by the present moment. It's affected by what we do here and now. Yes, God is outside of time. He is eternal. Uh, but our relationship with him is affected by the present moment. Similar to our relationships with other people. Think of a marriage. And within a marriage, husband and wife, they end up offending each other. And hopefully there's forgiveness, right? Uh, there might need to be some consequences to try to deter that sinful behavior in the future. But ultimately there's forgiveness. This is what we vowed the day of the wedding before God, that we would love this person as he loves them, that we would forgive them. We would move forward. Uh, but after that forgiveness, you know, and hopefully there's that resolution, we're not going to bring up the things of the past anymore. It's very possible in the future that they offend each other again, right? And it wounds the relationship anew. And there need to be new acts of mercy, new acts of forgiveness, similar in our relationship with God. Yes, Jesus Christ won forgiveness for our sins, for all of our sins, all at once, through his death on the cross, but it, it does not affect all of our sins all at once. The sins we have not yet committed have yet, not yet damaged our relationship with God. God will apply mercy to those sins when we repent of them in the future. But also we see it's not as beautiful to believe once saved, always saved. It is not a greater view of God's mercy because effectively it's to say that God doesn't leave the person free to offend him anymore. That he doesn't leave them free to reject him anymore. Like a condition here that, uh, yeah, I'll forgive all of your sins and give you salvation on the condition that you can no longer walk away from me. Well, God doesn't do that. God totally respects our freedom and he leaves us free to commit serious sin again and the beauty of his mercy is that yes it is so great it is so unfathomable that he's ready to forgive us every single time we repent truly of those sins we bring them before his representative in confession the peace comes not from oh i can never lose it again but from knowing that despite my weakness, despite that I might walk away from God, that he's never going to say, all right, that was it. That was your last chance. No more mercy for you. Like, nope, you've committed it too many times. That, that's it. No more mercy for you. No. As, as, as long as there is breath, as long as we're in this world, there is hope. Right? We can turn to his mercy, a humble and contrite heart he will not spurn. When we have this fuller view, this accurate view of God's mercy— then we're able to appreciate the special grace offered to us on Divine Mercy Sunday. Our Lord said to St. Faustina about this day, the soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. Right? And punishment. What, 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 do we, what does he mean by this? Uh, if we're trying to explain to someone about the special grace, it's good to be able to you know, go through these steps. Uh, we know that if we die right after we're baptized, then we go straight to heaven, right? Uh, the, God applies at our baptism all the merits of his passion to any sins we might have committed beforehand. And he doesn't require that we make reparation for those sins before baptism. Uh, but for those sins committed after baptism, out of justice... He does require some reparation. 
Yes, we repent of them in confession. They no longer have power to send us to hell. But as we said, we have wounded the relationship. Uh, after baptism, we have spurned him in greater or lesser ways by turning back to sin. And so out of justice, he requires some reparation. And we can do this reparation by prayers, uh, good works, works of mercy, uh, and acts of mortification. This is why we get the penance at the end of, of the confession, right? To help us get started on that reparation. But perhaps there's a lot of reparation to make if we had years or very grave sins. And if we do not finish that reparation before we die, then there will be purgatory. This is a true doctrine. And we want to recognize that too as an act of God's mercy, right? That he gives us the chance to finish the purification even after death. Now, of course, we don't want to go to purgatory and God doesn't want us to have to go to purgatory. He wants to be able to embrace us in full union in, with him in heaven right after we die. Uh, but this is a reality. God is holy, holy, holy. And if we are standing there at our judgment, we recognize that we still have this attachment to cre creatures or to sin, we will not be able to stand in his presence. We will want to be purified. And God allows that to happen. And so we, we do everything we can here and now to lessen the time in purgatory. We speak of plenary indulgences. The church uh, has the authority given her by our Savior, by the divine bridegroom, to grant indulgences. An indulgence is the remission, the taking away of part or all of that temporal punishment, that reparation that is left for us to make for our sins. And some people, they think the, the grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is the same as a plenary indulgence. Well, no. The, the goal is the same. Right? The effect that we're aiming for is the same. We want it to be as if we had just been baptized. We want the slate to be wiped clean. Right? That's what happens if we obtain a plenary indulgence. The remission of all our sin and the punishment that would be due to them. But a, temp, a, a, a plenary indulgence includes that very difficult condition of being completely detached from all sin, mortal and venial. That's very hard. It's very hard to know if we have this complete detachment. And so we, we can be trying to get a plenary indulgence, and I encourage you to try to do this even every day, uh, such as with work such as praying the rosary in a chapel or with a group, or, or adoring our Lord in the Eucharist for half an hour, uh, or reading scripture prayerfully for half an hour. These are some everyday ways that you can try to obtain a plenary indulgence with the other usual conditions. Uh, but again, it's hard to know, did I get one? Did I obtain a, the, the indul indulgence? Did I have a uh, complete detachment from sin? If we didn't, then we at least get a partial indulgence. That's good too. Uh, but yes, it's like, oh, if I could just for sure have that plenary indulgence. The effect of that, that's what Jesus is making so much easier for us on Divine Mercy Sunday. We don't have that condition that we need to be completely detached from sin. The only things he mentions is go to confession and receive Holy Communion. On Divine Mercy Sunday, receive Holy Communion. The confession could have been yesterday or days before. Uh, it doesn't have to be on the day necessarily. We do that. We, can, we're, we have that surety, that, that confidence. I did both things he said clean slate, wiped clean. That's why I was like, yes, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> but let it not just be about avoiding suffering. You know, those years ago when I first learned about this, I was like, yes, that's what I want. I don't want to suffer in purgatory. <laughs> and that's very natural for us, right? That, yeah, I don't want to suffer in hell or in purgatory. Uh, but if, if our rejoicing today only goes that far, then we still don't have the complete picture of God's mercy. The focus of our Lord is not just taking away suffering. The focus of our Lord is divine intimacy, is us reaching the, the most complete union with him possible even during this life, right? To reach the, the highest levels of prayer, to reach the heights of sanctity, the transforming union, right? That's what our Lord wants for us. And so for him, it's not just about taking away the suffering of purgatory, but removing all the obstacles to divine intimacy. 
the idea comes to mind of uh, you ha maybe you had a romantic relationship where you just totally messed everything up, right? And, and you lost the person. And you're regretting it. And you're thinking, oh, all those things I did wrong. I wish I could go back. I wish I could start over. I wish the person would take me back <laughs> to go back to the beginning. Jesus is willing to do that, right? to wipe the slate completely clean. There's that song by little Anthony. If we could start anew, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd gladly take you back and tempt the hand of fate. Right? Yes, Jesus has this sentiment, right? He is so ready to take us back, to wipe the slate clean. Let's start again. Let's begin again. Right? Let's do it right this time, right? Of course, no, he didn't do anything wrong, right? It's all us. Uh, but, so yes, us, let's do it right this time. Let us not just, oh, yay, okay, get to reset on the, the, the debt I owe in purgatory. But no, Jesus, this time, you know, let me, I respond ever so perfectly to your grace, uh, to to do your will, to seek your will above all things, to try to never offend you again. Right? This is what we want to aim for, divine intimacy. Uh, and then tell everybody else. Go out and tell everybody else, right? Uh, pamphlets of divine mercy. Uh, tell them about the special grace. Pray the chaplet for them. Invite them to pray the chaplet of divine mercy. Our Lord has very powerful words about the chaplet. He says that when we pray the chaplet before death, that he will stand not as the just judge, but as the merciful savior between that person and his father. Uh, he says, when we pray by the bedside of a dying person, right, even if, let's say they're unconscious, but we're praying it for them, he said you know, he's still offering that mercy. Right? So let us have great hope in mercy for our loved ones, loved ones who might have left the faith. Uh, if they don't already have one, offer them an image of the divine mercy. Right? Are you willing at least to, will you, would you accept this image? Would you put it up in your home? And hopefully there's at least some openness, some love for Jesus that they will. And Jesus says that those who venerate his image, even once, that there will be graces of mercy for them. And right? he's not going to forget about that. Uh, we want to, uh, yes, invite them to pray that chaplet with us. He says, those who say the chaplet, even once, there will be great graces of mercy. Never lose hope. I, I never despair of someone's salvation. Uh, tr be inspired by those words of Jesus. And he uses the word so many times, unfathomable. How unfathomable his mercy is. How infinite it is. How uh, unimaginable, inconceivable. <laughs> uh, but more than all else, he uses the word unfathomable. And in, in that, with that idea in mind, he says that no mind, be it of man or angel will ever be able to fathom his mercy. No mind, be it of man or angel, will ever be able to fathom his mercy throughout all of eternity. So let that inspire us to never lose hope, continue to bring our family before him, and the last thing I want to mention to you is something that stuck out to me from the diary just within the last month or so, uh, oh, last few months. Our Lord says that at the three o'clock hour, especially there, when, the hour when he died, we want to remember his mercy. He, he tells St. Faustina, even if for a brief moment, immerse yourself in my passion, he says uh, to ask things of him by virtue of his passion. He says, immerse yourself in my passion, particularly in my moments of abandonment and agony during his passion. And he says, I will refuse nothing to the soul that asks something of me by virtue of my passion. Hear that again. I will refuse nothing of the soul that asks something of me by virtue of my passion at that moment. So take that with you. Set your alarm. When the three o'clock hour goes, pray the three o'clock prayer. You expire, Jesus, but the, source of, but the fount of mercy ocean opened up for the whole world. Uh, unfathomable divine mercy. I'm so overwhelmed that I'm not remembering the whole thing. But pray that prayer and then take a moment to immerse yourself in his mercy. My Jesus, I immerse myself in your mercy. Picture yourself there at the foot of the cross. Imagine him crying out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? 
Unite yourself with him in that moment and tell him, by virtue of your passion, my Jesus, I bring to you this loved one, you know, this family member, this friend. Uh, I ask you for their return to grace, for their salvation, right? and believe that there will be mercy. God love you.